in the years of Wolfson's life, from around 1008 to 1095, eight kings ruled over England, from Aethelred the Unready to William II. Political instability and Danish and Norman invasions were the backdrop to Wolfson's life. He was the last surviving Anglo-Saxon bishop who played a significant role in the preservation of English values in an Anglo-Norman age. He redesigned Worcester Cathedral, helped the poor, and he fought against the slave trade out of Bristol. Over the next half hour, I will journey through the life and works of Wolfston, his early years and education, and his time at Worcester as prior and bishop. I will discover why Wolfton became a saint and how he is celebrated today. In 1008, in the town of Long Itchington in Warwickshire, Wolfston, a name probably influenced by the Archbishop of York at the time, was born to Wolfgiver and Athelstan. What we know about Wolfson's life was written soon after he died by his chaplain and later biographer, Coleman. William of Malmesbury translated it into Latin, calling it the Vita Wolfstani, but Coleman's original is now lost. At around the age of five, Wolfston started his education at Evesham Abbey, about 30 miles from Long Etchington, which was at least a day's travel. Here, Wolfston would first experience a monastic environment, an environment that would shape his beliefs. He would have learned to read both Latin and English. He would learn psalms and hymns and learn the ways of the Benedictine rule. His time at Evesham was poorly recorded by the Vita Wolfstani, perhaps because he spent a short time here. Around 1016, Wolfson continued his education at Peterborough Abbey, which would have been a considerable distance from his hometown. It was also in 1016 that King Canute succeeded the throne after his invasion against Aethelred. Canute had stabilised the nation, and the government continued traditionally. The stories that we are told by the Vita Wolfstani are the ones that give us an indication as to how his schooling had influenced Wolfston's life. A story that particularly stands out is when Wolfston returned home from Peterborough in about 1023. When returning home, a girl in the village started to do an alluring dance in front of him. The Vita Wolfstani doesn't suggest what happened next, but Wolfston felt weak and he ran away and hid in the bushes and cried. This event helped to convince Wolfston that a life of celibacy was intended for him. In 1033, almost 10 years after leaving Peterborough, Bishop Brichthayar, who had been made bishop that year, appointed Wolfston as Episcopal clerk. Impressed by Wolfston's work, he was later ordained and appointed to Hawkesbury Church in Gloucestershire, which belonged to Pershaw Abbey. Wolfston became a model priest. He would set himself on a course of fasting and abstinence to grow in spiritual strength. He was only here for a few years, and in William of Malmesbury's Deeds of English Bishops and in the Vita Wolfstani, it tells the story of a goose that he ordered to be roasted. The smell of the cooking wafted into the chancel in which Wolfston was celebrating Mass. The smell of the cooking put him off and distracted him at an important point in the liturgy. The Vita of Stani wrote, His soul melted in delight, as it were foretasting the goose. He was angered by his weakness, and so took an oath on the blessed sacrament to never eat meat again, and this was years before he joined the Benedictine rule. Bishop Brichthayar offered him a much richer benefice just outside of Worcester, but Wolfston was not tempted and refused the offer. 
It was then in around 1037 that Wolfson decided that he would become a monk so that he could offer to God not only fragments of his life, but the whole of it. His time at Evesham and Peterborough, and the stories of the village girl and the cooked goose, which both distracted him away from his spiritual destiny, showed that his early years would set Wolfton on a path that would inevitably take him to the monastery at Worcester. Ever since Benedict of Nursia wrote his rule in the early 530s, it became like, how one historian put it, the principal blueprint for monastic life. Over 400 years later, Oswald founded the Benedictine monastery here at Worcester. Wolfston would then embark his life at Worcester as a Benedictine monk. The life of a monk was a heroic struggle to conquer his free will and sensuality. He wouldn't own property and would live a life of abstinence and silence. The 10th century Regularis Concordia was used at Worcester, which laid out how monks should observe the Benedictine rule. I spoke to Dr. David Morrison about the life of a monk in Wolfston's time. The kind of manuscripts that Wolfstan would have seen uh, included uh, this collection of saints' lives from uh, the 11th century and also biblical texts. Uh, this, for example, is a book of Isaiah with a commentary by St. Jerome made in Worcester. Uh, or perhaps uh, this one, which is Bede's work on grammar and poetry. Uh, they were written on calfskin, by and large, and uh, the Anglo-Saxons used pumice stone to smooth down uh, both sides of the skin. And then they used a variety of ingredients for the ink, uh, but particularly um, iron sulphate and oak apple gall. And there's uh, some kind of chemical reaction between those two, which is one of the reasons why medieval ink always looks so dark. There would have been a variety of services uh, in the Benedictine uh, monasteries. So it would have started off at midnight with matins, running through uh, lords, prime, terse, um, sex, known vespers and compline right at the end of the uh, day and then they would have had a short rest before they had to get up again at midnight for the next round of services so it must have been quite tiring for the monks. Wolfson went through a series of promotions in his early years as a monk. He was first appointed novice master where he educated boys who were destined for the church and that's where he probably told his stories of chastity and abstinence he was then made the cantor or presenter, where he led the contact of the liturgy. He was then made the sacrist, which enabled him to have more time for prayer. It was at this point that Wolfton went through what is believed as a point of crisis in his life. He would often hold continuous vigils throughout the night, and he had no feather bed, which other monks did. He did not yield himself to sleep, but snatched at it. During the night, Wolfson would often use other churches to pray. The Vita Wolf Steini writes that one time in St. Peter's Church, which was the church before Oswald built his cathedral, Wolfson was praying and a peasant disturbed him and didn't like his presence. Wolfson continued to pray, but the peasant charged at him and started to wrestle with him. Wolfson saw this as the devil in disguise and so fought back and pushed him away. The fight lasted quite a while, but eventually the peasant gave up, but stamped on Wolfton's foot before leaving the church. In December 1038, Bishop Brichthayar died, and Bishop Lifing succeeded him. Lifing was an ambitious, yet uncontrollable man who was said to have broken church laws to get his way. It was also at this time that Hartknut succeeded the throne of England, who too was an unpopular figure. He greatly increased the tax to pay off his war fleet. In 1041, two tax collectors, Feeder and Thurston, were killed outside the cathedral by the citizens of Worcester. In retaliation, Hartknut ordered to kill all the citizens and burn the city to the ground. Thanks to an advance warning, the citizens escaped to Bevery Island in the middle of the River Severn, 
which they fortified and used as their base. Worcester was however plundered for four days. In 1055, the position of Prior was left open. Bishop Ealdred, who had succeeded Lifing in 1046, appointed Wolfson as Prior or Provost, as it was known at the time. It was an easy decision for Eldred to make, as his previous roles had proved that he was worthy for the position. He started his role as prior with enthusiasm. He started to reform matters within and outside the priory. These included lands that had been lost by predecessors. He also enforced the Benedictine rule by telling stories of his childhood. He was dedicated to his pastoral duties. He would stand outside the doors of the cathedral and he would talk to the people of Worcester and listen to their troubles. He would baptise children from poor families who couldn't afford the financial demands of parish priests. People from the countryside outside of Worcester would flock to receive his baptismal blessing and even the rich would come to him believing that he was the only person that could hold a true baptism. Wolfston soon attracted the nobles of England, and it was probably in 1055 when Earl Howard Godwinson, who had that year gained control of Herefordshire, befriended Wolfston, who in turn became Howard's spiritual advisor. It is written in the Vita Wolfstani that he loved Wolfston above all men. One of the last events to happen while Wolfston was prior was the building of the Belfry the Vita Wolfstani writes that during the building there were a set of precarious ladders all set up to access the site. One workman climbed up the ladders but fell a 40 foot drop. Wolfston was standing by. He made the sign of the cross on his chest. The workman stood up with absolutely no injuries and he blessed Wolfston and he walked away. Whether this was a lucky escape or Wolfston's healing work, it showed that Wolfston was starting to create miracles during his lifetime. Bishop Ealdred was elected as Archbishop of York in 1060. Pope Nicholas II refused to allow him to continue his control over Worcester, which his predecessors had done. Ealdred returned to England from Rome with two legates sent by the Pope to ensure that a suitable candidate would be found for Worcester. Wolfston's self-discipline, especially his fasting during Lent, his teachings and his strict observance of the Benedictine rule were admired by the legates. Wolfston, however, at first refused to be a bishop. It is said that he proclaimed that he would rather have lost his head than to be a bishop. It was usual for such holy individuals to say they were not worthy for such a position, but for Wolfston, it was genuine and it took six months to persuade him that he was right for the role. And at the Easter Court in 1062, Wolfston was made Bishop of Worcester. The King invested Wolfston with the bishopric. He presented him with his Episcopal staff and ring, the symbols of his temporal authority of the bishopric. Archbishop Ealdred consecrated Wolfston in September the same year. It was York and not Canterbury that consecrated him, as Archbishop Stigand was known as a usurper and so wasn't fit to be consecrating bishops. Wolfston continued his good works during his early years as Bishop of Worcester. He was still true to the religious rule of a monk. He made frequent visits around the diocese and enforced moral reform. But it was at this time that there was growing background political instability. The relationship between Earl Harold Godwinson and Edward the Confessor had deteriorated. The Earl was a powerful influence in the country as he owned many lands in England. His brother, Earl Tostig, was causing trouble in the north. He had allied with Harold Hardrada to take on England. In 1065, Wolfston, along with other participants, 
attended the Christmas court, and it was here that they witnessed King Edward's death. Harold's coronation was soon after, and the sixth king was made during Wolfton's life, but it would be the last of the Anglo-Saxon kings. King Harold was successful in his campaign against his brother Tostig and Hardrada and Stamford Bridge. But almost three weeks later, in mid-October 1066, Duke William of Normandy crossed the Channel and landed with his invasion force at Pevensey and faced Harold at Hastings. Harold was killed and William was victorious and was crowned King of England at Christmas the same year. This battle changed the shape of England. The Anglo-Norman nation had been formed, and it transformed the ecclesiastical life of Wolfston's diocese. William's invading army continued its devastation into the rest of England. Wolfston, along with other individuals, swore an oath of loyalty to the new king. But in April 1070, he was summoned to a council that decided who would keep their positions in the church. Many English clerics were dismissed, including Stigand, who was replaced with Lanfranc. Eldred died and was replaced with Thomas of Bayeux. Wolfston was in good standing with King William and later William II, and he kept his bishopric and he often helped the newly appointed archbishops. Lanfranc, however, at first wanted Wolfston to resign, but there is a legend that Wolfston pushed his staff into the stonework of Edward the Confessor's tomb, and that only he, the true Bishop of Worcester, could remove it. The Norman age brought with it a change of architecture, and in the 1080s, Wolfston embarked on one of his most significant achievements of his life redesigning Worcester Cathedral. I talked to archaeologist Chris Guy about Wolfston's Cathedral. The crypt was started in 1084. It was the first part of the new Norman Cathedral to be built, replacing two Saxon cathedrals. It has round arches. The crypt is one of the largest of its period in England um, and is a series of arcades, all to say with round arches. Um, resting on columns uh, with capitals um, in various different styles, um, but conforming to a basic ground plan. The crypt was um, ordered by Bishop Wolfston, who was the last Saxon bishop to be appointed. Um, and it may have been a Norman uh, architect or master mason who overlooked the work, but the work was almost certainly carried out under his control by Saxons. We know that the, the crypt didn't take that long to build because in 1089 they had a, a synod or a meeting down here. So by then the crypt must have been finished and possibly the entire east end of the cathedral. The, the plan of the cathedral was, is laid out by Wolfston, but the two west bays were rebuilt in the late 12th century. And although they incorporate some Norman architectural styles, like round arches and some of the decoration, they are moving into the next architectural style, so the arches are becoming slightly more pointed. Um, and it's a transition from Norman architecture into early English. After they'd rebuilt the two west bays in the late 12th century, they started rebuilding the rest of the nave, working from the east end on the north side, working westwards, did the north side first and then they rebuilt the south side. And there is a change in architectural style part way down the north side, possibly caused by the Black Death, but that is not certain. Wolfston laid the foundations of the cathedral we see today. The crypt is a lasting monument to the genius architecture of the Norman age and Wolfston's design. Although a lot has been rebuilt or restored over the centuries, I think I can safely say that he will be proud of the cathedral here at Worcester.
When Wollstone finished the cathedral, he placed a charter with his seal upon the altar as a gift to his monks. It granted them more land as the monastery had grown in numbers. Many parish churches were built or repaired within the diocese. Westbury Church, for example, was falling down and needed repairing. So Wolfton rebuilt it from the foundations upward and later placed Coleman, Wolfton's chaplain and later biographer, as prior. Malvern Priory and Clane's Church were also built by Wolfston. After the Norman conquest, Wolfston continued his great pastoral work. He preached to a congregation that had been affected by the Norman conquest and the Norman settlers. He also played a significant and successful role in preaching against the slave trade which operated out from Bristol to Ireland. The Norman Conquest brought change to English society, but Wolfston was keen to continue English values in a spiritual and religious sense. In the Cathedral Library, there was evidence of how manuscript writing didn't entirely change during Wolfston's life. At Worcester, there are some good similarities between the Anglo-Saxon manuscripts and the Norman ones. Um, because St Wolfston is still in charge, he allows the monks um, to continue in a very similar style. So um, this is a 10th century manuscript, for example, and we can see the decoration on the tail of the letter. And yet in this 12th century Worcester manuscript, again, we have very similar decoration on the tail of the letter M. And also you can see the similarities between the size of the handwriting in the Anglo-Saxon book and yet in the Norman one it's almost identical. It is written in the Vita Wolfstani that Wolfston himself said that he would live to an old age, and he did. In his last days he knew that his time was coming and he believed that Christ was making him ready for his departure. He continued to pray and say psalms and he was known to calmly sit in the chapel and watch the workmen build his cathedral. He received the Eucharist daily to prepare for his journey to heaven. The Vita Wolfstani writes, he breathed forth his last breath a little after midnight on Saturday the 19th of January in the year of the incarnation of our Lord, 1095, the eighth year of the reign of William II when he had been bishop for 34 years, four months and 13 days, and in about the 87th year of his age. Wolfston was buried alongside the shrine of St Oswald near the high altar. Soon afterwards, he appeared in the dreams of sleeping monks, telling them to continue their good work. The shrine miraculously survived fires, which destroyed some parts of the cathedral. But at the Reformation, the shrines were destroyed and the bodies of the two saints were wrapped in lead and reburied north of the high altar. Their last resting place is yet to be discovered. Nearly 200 years later, Pope Innocent III made Wolfston a saint. King John, who often visited Worcester and his shrine, wanted the saint to be his spiritual patron. King John also used the history of Wolfston during his dispute with the Pope, claiming that it was the king's right to appoint bishops, as it was the right for Edward the Confessor to appoint Wolfston. In 1216, when King John died, he wanted to be buried between the shrines of Oswald and Wolfston. John's tomb depicts an effigy of Wolfston. And now, over a thousand years later, Wolfston is still remembered and celebrated to this day. There is a church in Worcester, in Warndon, one of the estates in the northeast of the city, and uh, it was felt that there was a need for a church there sometime in the early 1960s when people started celebrating the Eucharist around uh, somebody's kitchen table. And on the 19th of January 1963, the church was dedicated on the feast of St Wolfston, and it's known as St Wolfston's Church in Warndon.
In 2008, we celebrated a thousand years since Wolfston's birth. I wasn't a residential canon here in Worcester at the time, but I remember being a vicar in the north of the diocese, and people from across the diocese came to celebrate St Wolfston. There were processions through the streets of Worcester telling the story of his life, and people then met in the cathedral for a great celebration. Because St Wolfston is a local saint and he's also a saint of the pre-Reformation period, this gives us a great opportunity as a cathedral to welcome our brothers and sisters from different Christian denominations. And prayers have been said in this cathedral on St Wolfston's Day by the Bishop of Worcester along with the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Birmingham. St Wolfstone's feast day is the 19th of January, which is the day of his death. And we have a special prayer that we read on that day. It's known as a collect, and this is the prayer. Lord God, who raised up Wolfstone to be a bishop among your people and a leader of your church, help us after his example to live simply, to work diligently, and to make your kingdom known through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Even with all the surviving evidence, we will never fully understand or have a complete picture of the life and times of Wolfton. Like many other medieval sources, it is sometimes difficult to realise its intentions, but at least we can see into a life that has helped to shape the Christian faith in Worcester. Wolfton was a church builder establishing places of worship all across his diocese, including this fine cathedral. He was an administrator who understood the importance of record keeping. He was a miracle worker who during his lifetime and after he performed miracles. He, most importantly, was someone who was dedicated to his pastoral duties, helping those around him. He probably touched the lives of those he met and those who needed him. He believed firmly in the Christian faith, and even through the trials and troubles of his life, he followed in the footsteps of his Saviour.